The scripture teaches that God has given you a spiritual gift. This is a special ability empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, God has given us the spiritual gifts for several reasons, to expand his kingdom here upon the earth, to evangelize the lost, and especially to build one another in Christ. I'm going to be beginning a brand new Spirit Church teaching series. This one is entitled, The Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we go through this series, that you would grow in your understanding of the spiritual gifts and discover the gifts that God has given to you. So we're starting this first part here on this edition of Spirit Church on Encounter TV. But before we begin, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in worship, and then we're going to get right into this lesson. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. And purify my heart. Let me be as God and precious silver. Purify my heart. Let me be as God. Pure gold and pure. So what are the spiritual gifts? The spiritual gifts are special abilities that the Holy Spirit has given to each and every believer. God has deposited a gift inside of you. Now I've broken down the spiritual gifts into three primary categories. Now the first category is what I call the service gifts. And here I need to mention that I do believe that all of the gifts are used for service, the service of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to service as the body of Christ, the world in evangelizing it, and various other ways. So the spiritual gifts, all of them, are service gifts. But just for the sake of categorization, I've given this first category the name service gifts. So what are these service gifts? Number one, there is the gift of exhortation, which is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. Now this is the gift of encouragement. There is the gift of giving, which is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 8 also. There is the gift of leadership, also found in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. There is the gift of service, which is Romans chapter 12, verse 7. There is the gift of administration, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Now these are, as I said, under the category, at least how I've placed them, of the service gifts. Now the service gifts are basically abilities that are empowered by the Holy Spirit that would otherwise not be as effective. So you may look at some of these gifts and saying, well, encouragement doesn't seem to be supernatural, or giving, or leadership, or service, or administration. That doesn't seem to have a supernatural touch to it. Well, the truth is that the Holy Spirit empowers us in both the supernatural and the practical. So these service gifts, though they are practical in the way they are carried out, 
are sourced in the spirit and therefore are supernatural in nature. In other words, you can encourage and give and lead and serve and administrate at a level that you would not have been able to do otherwise without the aid of the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk more about these in the coming sermons in this series. Number two, the category of power gifts. Now these are, these are gifts that have that supernatural touch in the way they are applied or in the way they are used. And number one, there's the gift of discernment, 1 Corinthians 12, 10. There's the gift of faith, 1 Corinthians 12, 9. There is the gift of healing, 1 Corinthians 12, 10. There is the word of knowledge, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. There is the word of wisdom, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. There is the gift of miracles, 1 Corinthians 12, 10. Also in 1 Corinthians 12, 10 are the gift of tongues and the gift of tongues interpretation. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, there is found the gift of prophecy. Now, these are the power gifts. And again, I'm going to also go over these in coming sermons. I just want to give you a quick overview of what the gifts are before we get into the primary teaching that I'm going to be giving you today. And then number three, the category of leadership gifts. These are primarily found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, but you'll see one namely the teaching gift found also in Romans chapter 12, verse 7. So there is the gift of the evangelist, the gift of the pastor, the gift of the teacher, the gift of the apostle, and the gift of the prophet. Now we're going to elaborate on all of these gifts all throughout this series, but I want to talk to you about some truths that I think are fundamental to your understanding of the spiritual gifts. These are things that you need to know about the spiritual gifts before you begin to operate in them. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is going to be somewhat of an expository teaching. I'm basically going to go verse by verse, and we're going to pull the truth from the scripture here concerning the spiritual gifts. So go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 first. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 say, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that Paul mentions when writing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that he does not want the Corinthians to be captured or recaptured by paganism. The Corinthians were into witchcraft and sorcery and paganism, and so they operated to some extent in power. They operated in demonic power. And Paul the Apostle is telling them that he does not want them to misunderstand the gifts. He does not want them to be ignorant concerning the spiritual gifts. He says, I know some of you, many of you were worshipers of idols and you were idolaters and you were into paganism and witchcraft and sorcery. So he's saying, I want you to know that these gifts are different. These gifts are not like the demonic power that you used to have. So he tells us in verse two, you know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept, swept along in worshiping speechless idols. Verse three, we'll read it again. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. So he's trying to differentiate the spiritual gifts from pagan power. The Corinthians worship Poseidon, they worship Aphrodite, they worship Asclepius. Now Asclepius was actually the god of healing or also the god of truth and also the god of prophecy. So the Corinthians worship these idols that had these special abilities and likely gave them special abilities through demonic power. So I'm not saying that we believe in these false deities or even that they existed. If they did, they were demonic beings and that is a whole different lesson for another time. But there was an ancient term that meant to live like a Corinthian. And to live like a Corinthian, everyone in the ancient world understood, was to live an immoral life. And so this life of idolatry, this life of immorality, this life of paganism and sorcery and witchcraft is what Paul is trying to pull them from and make sure that they do not revisit. So Paul did not want the Corinthians to confuse God's power for their former pagan power. So what's the difference here? How can we discern between demonic power, pagan power, 
and the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul gives us the answer. We'll read it again in verse 3, and I want you to really get this. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what's interesting here is that he doesn't mention methodology. He doesn't mention style. He doesn't mention the abilities that they operate in. He instead mentions the message that they are proclaiming. So if the church understood this, if the modern church understood what Paul was teaching here, there would be greater levels of unity among the brethren. So this is why you cannot judge someone based upon their methodology or based upon the fact that they move in the power of the Holy Spirit. I see people all the time. They'll actually quote this verse. Let's read it and then we'll, we'll go over it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, those who are skeptics, those who are against the spiritual gifts or who we call cessationists. In other words, there are people who believe that God does not move through the gifts anymore. He does not have prophets. He does not empower people to heal the sick. And it's sad that some people actually believe that when if they were reading the scripture, they wouldn't come to that conclusion. But they'll point to scriptures like this. Matthew chapter 7, they'll say, see, those people prophesied and look at where they end up. But it's not that they prophesied that was the reason that they ended up being separated from the Lord. That was, an that was something else entirely. God does not judge us based upon the gifts that we use. God judges us based upon what we do with the Lordship of Jesus Christ, how we respond to the gospel, how we respond to his offer of salvation, how we repent or don't repent. That's the judgments that God uses. So I'm looking at this verse and I see that these are people who operated in the gifts without knowing Jesus. This just goes to show you that you cannot judge anyone based upon their gifts. So not everyone who demonstrates power is demonic and not everyone who demonstrates power is godly. So the gifts or the gifts in operation in someone's life, that is not the standard by which we judge one another. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits, not by their gifts. So it's neither here nor there whether or not someone is operating in the gifts. So it's not the use of the gifts that sends someone to hell, and it's not the lack of the use of the gifts that sends someone to hell. What we need to look at here is the message being proclaimed by those who demonstrate the power. So he is saying that the difference between the pagan power, obviously other than the source of that power, and the power of the Holy Spirit is the message being proclaimed by the one who demonstrates such power. In other words, the one who is using their gifts, their spiritual God-given gifts, to point to Jesus as Lord, to point to Jesus as Savior, is the one that God is blessing, is the one that God is truly using. Now, someone can go and use their spiritual gift for something else, and that is sorcery. And sadly, there are some around today who use spiritual gifts that they've acquired from God and they go and they use it for financial gain. They go and they use it to promote themselves. They go and they use it without ever mentioning Jesus once. In fact, I've been in church services where the gifts were in full operation, but there was not one mention of Jesus. And there was a lack of substance. There was a lack of the glory. There was a lack of the presence and there was even a lack of peace. When you use the gifts of the Holy Spirit without purposing in your heart to use those gifts to lead people to Jesus. When you use the gifts of the Holy Spirit without preaching Jesus, be careful, that's borderline sorcery. That's borderline paganism. That's charismatic witchcraft when you focus primarily upon the gifts. I don't need to follow signs. If I follow Jesus, signs will follow me. I simply preach the gospel and use the gifts as an aid to the gospel message, not as a replacement for the gospel message. So if you go to a ministry and all they ever talk about is the gifts, all I'm, I'm not saying they can't teach on them or mention them or use them or even emphasize them from time to time. 
But if all they ever preach is prophecy, all they ever preach is giving, all they ever preach is healing, then there's something wrong there. And this is what Paul is telling us to avoid, to avoid that idolatry, to avoid that empty power, to avoid that paganism, that sorcery, that witchcraft. He's saying that you will know by the ones who proclaim Jesus as Lord. Look at that verse again, knowing what I just told you. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He's not saying that no one can use that phrase without the Holy Spirit. He's saying that no one who truly is filled with the Holy Spirit will not preach the salvation message, will not preach the Lordship of Christ. So look at the message, not the methodology, not the style, not whether or not they're similar enough to you. Look at what they are proclaiming. Look at who they're preaching. Are they preaching self? Are they preaching money? Are they just preaching miracles? Or are they preaching salvation? Are they preaching the Lordship of Christ? Are they preaching Jesus? That is how you can discern between the true gifts of the Holy Spirit and gifts that are being used out of order. So we avoid paganism through using the gifts to emphasize the gospel message of Jesus Christ, not the gifts themselves. Let's continue to read verses 4 through 6. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Did you see that? Watch this again, and this time I'm going to have underlined a few words for you in the Scripture. Look at this. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Did you see that? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a reference to the Trinity right here when he's talking about the distribution of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 7, the scripture says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So you cannot say to yourself, I don't have a spiritual gift. God has given you a spiritual gift. How do I know? The Bible says it right here. It says a spiritual gift is given to each of us, the brethren, the sisters in Christ. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I want you to hear this. This is going to bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three got together, took a vote, made a decision, and distributed to you your spiritual gift. In other words, the spiritual gift that you have, it was decided upon by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in unity. And they chose your gift. I want you to really think about that. This means that this is something that was done intentionally. The mind of the Father, the mind of the Son, the mind of the Spirit, all working together to decide what gift you would get. They don't make mistakes. And in fact, what the Trinity does in unity can never be undone. This is why the Bible says in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, for God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. The source of your gift is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So if you believe that you have lost a spiritual gift, you're being lied to by the devil. If you believe you've lost the gift of prophecy, or lost the call of God, or lost the anointing on your life, and that it can never come back to you, that is a lie from the enemy. For the Bible says, let's read it again, I want you to get this in your spirit. For God's gifts and His call can never, I want you to say it, can never be withdrawn. They are with you forever. God has placed them in you. The Trinity decided upon it. The Trinity in unity caused it to be so, and it cannot be undone. For again, what the Trinity does in unity cannot be undone. They are the source of the gift. God has given to you a gift. So. That first point we're gleaning from 1 Corinthians 12, we want to avoid paganism or avoid sorcery. So we want to make sure that the gifts have their place in 
the proper place so that we're not causing them to be the primary thing, but there's something that points to the primary thing, which is the gospel or Christ himself. Number two, I want you to understand the source of the gift. Now let's continue to read or again read verse seven. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. The spiritual gifts are not a reward. They are a responsibility. The spiritual gifts are not given to you for status. They are given to you for service. They are not given to you so that you can put on a show. They are given to you so that you can make an impact. They are not given to you so that you can lift up your own name. They are given to you so that you can lift your brothers and your sisters in Christ. And when we use our gifts, we are serving not just the body, but the world. Think about this. The evangelist found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, is certainly a gift to the church. But the evangelist, in essence, is also a gift to the world because the evangelist is the one who takes the gospel message to the world. Some of the gifts of the Spirit work externally. Some of them work internally. Some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are used to touch the church within, and some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are used to touch the world without. But all of the spiritual gifts are of the church. Some work outside, some work inside, but all of them are of the church. And when I say they work outside of the church, I don't mean that they are disconnected from the church. I simply mean that they are used with an emphasis on reaching those who are outside of the church while remaining connected to the church itself. So let's continue to read now. So that was the point I wanted you to get there. The gifts are for service, not for status. Let's continue to read now verses 8 through 11, where the scripture says, to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge or the word of knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, we're going to touch on all of these in the coming weeks, but let's continue to read for now. I want to emphasize somewhere else here. We're going to read verses, begin reading at verse number 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body, so it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. And I want you to really listen to this, how the scripture says, so God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, 
those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages or speak in tongues. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in tongues or in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages or interpret tongues? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Now, verses 29 through 31, where it goes on asking the rhetorical questions, do all have gifts of this and all have gifts of that, we're going to address in part four of this series. But I want to just emphasize, and this will be my last point, that the gifts work most powerfully in unity. It's not a mistake that Paul mentions the Trinity while also talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he mentions the Trinity in passing while introducing this teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and introducing this concept of unity in the body of Christ. The, the Trinity is the greatest example of unity. Trinity Try unity, three united as one. So we all serve a function, and like the Trinity, who each member serves a function, we also all honor one another. God honors His Son, Jesus honors the Father, the Holy Spirit honors them both, and they both honor the Holy Spirit. In fact, I found it interesting that Paul the Apostle writes that those that we may deem as less important, God has placed the greatest honor upon. And I find it interesting that many people consider the Holy Spirit, I don't consider, I think they're all equal, but some people think that the Holy Spirit is a lesser in the Trinity. Yet Jesus gave him one of the greatest honors because he said, you can, you can blaspheme the Father, you can blaspheme the Son, but don't you dare blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He honors the Holy Spirit, he protects the Holy Spirit, and vice versa, and as it goes with all three of them. We are to be the same way. We are to be united with our brothers and sisters in the same way that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are united with one another. This is where our gifts will thrive in, in their greatest capacity. This is where our gifts will have the greatest power, is when we are all united. We need everyone doing what they do. We can't say to anybody, we don't need you because you're not enough like me, or I don't really agree with how you do that with your methodology. We need all the members of the body of Christ. It's interesting then that Paul the Apostle goes on after this to talk about love. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know that that's one of the greatest pieces of writing ever on the topic of love. But he wrote about that right after he talked about the spiritual gifts. He talks about the spiritual gifts, then he talks about unity, then he talks about love. Why? Because those are all what are necessary to give the spiritual gifts their greatest level of power. So as we read through 1 Corinthians 12, let me just recap with you. We found how to avoid paganism, and that is declaring the message of the gospel and not using the gifts to emphasize the gifts themselves or the person who uses the gifts. We looked at the source of the gift, so then that the gift cannot be taken away. We looked at the fact that the gifts are for service, not for status. Remember, God has given you the gift not so that you can elevate self, but so that you can edify one another or help one another spiritually. And again, spiritual gifts are simply abilities that God has given to each of us. And we're going to go over which, what those are in the coming weeks. And finally, the gifts work most powerfully in unity. Well, I want to pray with you now. And let's pray that as we begin this series together, that God would help you to not only discover your spiritual gifts, but understand your place in the body of Christ. You know, there are people who say, I don't want to go to church because I am the church. And nothing is, hardly a thing I've heard is more arrogant or foolish. And I don't care, look, I don't care if I offend you. I'm telling you the truth. You need to get into a church and you need to get plugged into a people. Why? Because we are to be united. You may say, well, a church is not a building. I understand that. All I'm saying is you need to be plugged in with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. If the scripture tells us that we're to use our spiritual gifts as a command, then how are we supposed to use our spiritual gifts to edify one another, not just the world, but edify one another? How are we supposed to do that without relationship and connection? We need to be united. So I pray that the Lord would give you a greater understanding of unity, and He would give you a greater understanding of love, and He would give you a greater understanding of how we work together 
to build the kingdom of God and to win the loss to Christ. I want to pray with you now for those things. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one receiving this prayer now who desires in their heart to be used by you, who desires in their heart to know their spiritual gifts. I pray, Father, that you would anoint that one, guide that one, and speak to that one. Reveal to them, Father, their spiritual gifts. And Father, help us to dwell in unity. Help us to love one another. And help us to use what you have given us to bring glory to your Son, Jesus, and not to ourselves. Not to us. To your name be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And I want you to say it if you agree. Say, Amen. Well, I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you would like to join the Spirit family or join Spirit Church, then go ahead and use the information at the bottom of the screen to become a member today. As a member of Spirit Church, you'll get an email from me every single Sunday. I'm going to send you the latest teachings, and you'll get those, and you'll also be able to reply for prayer support. You'll be joining a group, over 2,000 of us, from all around the world. So join the Spirit family today. I'm going to read now your comments from last week's teaching, and then I want you to stick around. I want to talk to you for a second. So here are the comments from the lesson, The Healing Presence of Jesus. Here's what you wrote. Thank you so much, Brother David, for the powerful message. You have just revealed who I get my healing from. It's only from Jesus. May the Heavenly Father bless you. Hardy Grace writes, I've been bedridden for almost seven days now and I've been asking God to heal me. When you were praying, I felt something inside me with peace and I'm continuing to feel it. I praise God for you. Leslie from the Philippines. God bless your ministry. Well, God bless you too. And we pray that the Lord would continue to work His healing power in your life. Shamar writes, Amen, Brother David. We are just vessels for the Master. The emphasis here is that Jesus is the only healer. There is no other healer. There is no one else who could perform the miraculous. It's only Jesus. Lovely Grace writes, Thank you, Pastor David. I sense the presence of Jesus now in my room, and I received healing. I pray that God will bless you more and use you more for His glory. God bless you, brother, in Christ. Christine Moses writes, What an anointed healing message, Pastor David. You are truly blessed. Ayette writes, Brother David, thanks for the amazing preaching. There's really a misconception in healing sometimes that they are looking to the person rather than the presence of God. I have learned many things. God bless your ministry. Well, thank you. We love you. and We appreciate those comments. And if God has spoken to you on this lesson, then go ahead and leave your comment on this video also. Now, I want to talk to you about something, so don't turn off the video yet. Many of you know we've been raising finances or monthly support for a brand new production facility here in Southern California. And here's the update. I told you I'd update you every week. Here's where we are in the campaign. You can see the progress that we are making. We are almost there, and I anticipate that we're going to be wrapping this up in just a few months as long as we keep up the pace of adding on that monthly support. Now, what do we need the monthly support for? It's very simple. We want to win more souls. And the facilities that we're looking at are going to require a greater amount of monthly support. This means that we need to pay for the rent or the lease or the mortgage or whatever deal we're able to work out. We need to pay the electric bill. We need to pay the maintenance, the cleaning, the security, the insurance. We need to hire on for extra hours the staff that's going to be working some of the new ministries that we're operating. From this facility, we're going to launch a brand new television network, the Encounter TV network. And this network is going to focus on the top box television sets and new media technology. In addition, we're going to be having a 24-7 prayer room. I know many of you love that. That's going to be so important to sustaining what God is doing. We're going to have a brand new production facility from which we can do live broadcasting and in which we can hold weekly meetings. The bottom line is this. This new production facility will enable us to reach more people 
than ever before, put out more content than ever before, and also with your monthly support, we'll begin to do more events than ever before, more miracle services than ever before. So become a partner with me today. For those of you who sign up to become a $30 a month partner or more, I'll send you a signed copy of either Carriers of the Glory or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. It's your choice. You can choose whichever one you want. Sign up today. We're almost there. We need the monthly support to come in so that we can take this next step of faith and do as the Lord has led us. Bottom line, again, I must emphasize, new production facility, more events, basically means we're winning more souls. You're helping us to expand the ministry and walk through more open doors than ever before. You just watch. God is doing something with this ministry And we are going to see a tremendous move of God. I believe it's time that the world sees the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's time our generation sees the power of the Holy Spirit. And I need your help to take it to them. We need to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations demonstrated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you watch, you're going to see a day when stadiums are filled with people giving their lives to Jesus. You're going to see the crowds coming by the thousands and repenting before the Lord and receiving their miracle. And you're going to be able to say, I was a part of that from the beginning stages. I was a part of the first time they began to really grow. I want you to be a part of it. Be a part of what God is doing. There are big, big, big things coming our way. And we are going to win the world for Jesus. I'm so excited about it. So sign up today to become a monthly partner. If you're watching this on YouTube, a link is going to appear at the end of this video. It's going to be a red link and it's going to say donate slash partner. Go ahead and click that link and sign up today to become a $30 a month supporter or more. We also appreciate one-time gifts or any other type of monthly support. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember... Nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.